storytelling back to the news. And in this, as, a, as our panelists for this panel is Maximilian Hoffman, head of news at Dutch Welle, Costa Mwansa, CEO at, at Diamond TV, and finally, Joseph Kigozi, Chief Strategy Officer at MBS. This panel will be moderated by Tamima Ibrahim, Head of Content at Switch TV in Kenya. Tamima, the screen is all yours. Thank you so much, Shana. So again, just to thank the participants for making the time to join us. Uh, on this panel, the topic is bringing storytelling back to news. And uh, obviously we have a very rich panel here. Uh, experts with a lot of experience in this particular area. So probably I'm just going to start by uh, allowing everyone to introduce themselves once more as we wait for more people to join us and probably just giving us a bit of a background in terms of uh, the network that you're working at and obviously the country that you represent. So probably let's start with my neighbor, next door neighbor, Joseph, all the way in Uganda. Uh, Joseph, you'll have to unmute, please. Sorry, thank you very much, Tamima. And of course, to the rest of uh, the panelists and whoever is uh, watching and listening in, I'm very excited to be part of this experience. Uh, I work for Next Media, uh, which is a, a media group, a multimedia group uh, in Uganda. And it, uh, it owns NBS, which is our flagship brand. And of course, uh, we control close to about 40% uh, uh, of, of the market share in, in Uganda. And uh, we, we are largely a current affairs channel. Our focus is current affairs, anything to do with current affairs. And of course, I work as the chief strategy officer. I am very delighted to be part of uh, uh, this journey of storytelling, of course, uh, courtesy of uh, Dutch Bella. Okay, then uh, over to you, Costa. Thank you so much, uh, Tamima, uh, and uh, good afternoon to colleagues uh, Max Hoffman and Joseph uh, you know, Kigozi, a good comrade of mine from Kampala, Uganda. Good afternoon to all those that are you know, joining us, uh, watching and uh, obviously listening in uh, on this very important and timely uh, African discussion. Uh, as has been introduced, my name is Costa Mwans. I'm uh, the Chief Executive Officer as well as Editor-in-Chief um, of Zambia's number one privately owned you know, TV station, Diamond TV. Um, we began our operations just four years ago. Uh, I'm co-owner and CEO of the channel right now. Our main programming focus is more on uh, breaking you know, news as well as lifestyle you know, content. Um, I have been practicing mainstream uh, newsroom journalism uh, for 16 years now until I went into the administrative side, uh, a role that I had now in terms of mobilizing uh, investment resource. I'm obviously looking at uh, the business development and growth of the channel. Okay, thank you for that, Costa. And finally, to uh, Maximilian. Thank you very much, Tamima. Honored to be part of this panel today with Joseph and Costa. Nice to see you all. I uh, work for Deutsche Welle. Deutsche Welle is uh, Germany's international broadcasters. We uh, produce content in over 30 languages. Um, for the TV part, it's four languages. Um, I'm in charge of uh, our news operations. So everything that needs to be fast and accurate, that's me. Uh, every, everywhere you, where you see BW News, that's also uh, my department on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook. Uh, also on, on TV, the news shows, and uh, also online, the news articles. So it's a pretty big department, and you really can't ever have your cell phone too far away from you because there's always something happening. And Deutsche Welle, for you, uh, those that may be not as familiar with it, uh, like I said, Germany's international broadcaster. Uh, we have about a billion views per month worldwide. You know, those numbers are always very hard to get if you're uh, operating worldwide, but this is a rough number that we have. And uh, just to give you maybe an idea to me about the things that we're going to talk about later, also those numbers have gone up significantly over the last year, also partly because of the reporting that we do on the COVID, COVID pandemic. Okay, super. So now that we all know each other a little better, let's jump straight into it. So we've had the exp we know the statement that uh, storytelling is one of the most powerful things in the world. It connects the dots of our evolution and telling the stories of our communities. 
And in fact, the elements of journalism describe it as story, news is storytelling with a purpose. So today we're gonna to be focusing on how it is our news can better connect and better engage with audiences. And the idea here is to try and at least understand that uh, most people and most audiences have a very fundamental yearning for stories. So when it comes to news production, I wanna ask each of you, so you've had the statement, anything can be news, but not everything is newsworthy. So today in 2021, what are some of the things that you must consider when selecting a good news story? Let's start with you, Joseph. And how has that probably shifted over the years? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Tamaima. Uh, I must say that there's been an evolution on what is considered as a, as a very good news story. Of course, the fundamentals remain the same in terms of impact, in terms of relevance, in terms of the consequences, in terms of what value addition does that story have. But over the years, uh, stories, uh, I mean, storytelling in news is, is, uh, is changing because of the needs of our, of our consumers, because of the demographics, uh, everything is changing. It's not just, uh, you know, the, 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 the old way of, of thinking about it. For me, the highlight is what we try to do at NBS is to ask ourselves a few questions. Uh, for what, for who do we do the news for? In, to what end is, is this news being done? What, what is the transformational element about this story? So everyone as a reporter continues to ask themselves that question. So in the end, uh, it's redefining what a new story should look like. For example, if it doesn't have a purpose, if, if it's not within our purpose to transform our people, to transform our communities, then we think that would not you know, you know, touch the dots. So, so, so as, as, as NBS, we, we've taken an approach of first and foremost doing a brand archeology span about who consumes our news, uh, who is that person that we are targeting? What is that that we, we need to, to do to make sure that it has the impact, the real impact that, that, that people are, are yearning for? And, and that's why uh, people sometimes, especially the, the millennials, are slowly but surely running away from, from news because it, it sometimes it doesn't speak to them. So, so how do you make news more sexier? How do you make news more, you know, without losing the ethical uh, you know, consideration, how do you create that impact in a community? And, and for me, that is the journey we are taking on. But the key highlight is, does it transform the person? Does it have a transformational effect? Probably this over to you, uh, Max. When we talk about bringing storytelling back to the news, have we lost it? Have we lost the art of storytelling in the news now, do you think? I don't think we've lost it. You know, there's so much news out there and there's uh, there's so many different um, news organizations nowadays uh, that wouldn't have even been available 10 years ago that I think you can find everything uh, and nothing uh, online or in different social platforms. It's just overwhelming. And um, first of all, what we need to do before we talk about the storytelling, I think is we need to earn people's trust as a news organization, especially millennials like Joseph mentioned, they're gonna ask the question, first of all, why should I trust you? And second of all, why should I let you into my home? You know, it would be on a smartphone or a computer or even the old fashioned TV screen. You know, why should I trust you? What's in it for me? Does it help me make a decision on my job prospects? Does, me, does it help me make life decisions? And so, yeah, the first step is always we got to be fast on the news because today everything is fast. You just don't stand a chance if you're too slow. If you want to make a mark, if you want to make, make a bump in what's happening, you got to ride that wave of the latest hashtag, for example. But then and that's where the storytelling comes in then we need to make sure that we deliver the context that people want, uh, especially younger people want to understand the world around them and to make those decisions. We see at Deutsche Welle where we also can be successful, you know, where we go in, in depth, where we give explanations, where we deliver context. And all of this obviously has to be, has to be accurate and balanced. Otherwise you're going to lose that trust. And I think that those are the key things. It's no longer, 
what it used to be uh, on TV, for example, you were looking for a protagonist and then that protagonist had to do this and that. And then afterwards you would find maybe the antagonist. And so it was basically, you were trying, a lot of journalists were trying to fit uh, what the reality into a, a storytelling scheme that you, you used to have. Mm. Nowadays, uh, if you have that, that's all good, right? But the most important thing in the storytelling is really delivering the context. Okay, so uh, both you and Joseph have touched a bit on audiences and maybe to you, Costa, if you look at uh, your current market, how has the news watching audience shifted? Uh, thank you so much. I think just to uh, add on to what my two colleagues have said, uh, social media and, and basically online technology uh, with the digital transformation has been a disruptor uh, of traditional formats of news delivery, uh, news packaging, and so on. Um, agreeing with Max, uh, the, the, the traditional media houses, the credible ones, definitely have not lost the aspect of, of, of storytelling. The biggest challenge is that uh, we have so many uh, players now uh, in the digital media space that you fail to differentiate between who's a professional, credible and qualified you know, journalist and a media house, as opposed to bloggers and so many people churning out uh, various information that the, the consumer, the end user uh, has so much you know, to, to, to decipher from and, and, and has a challenge of what is true and what is, 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 is not true. Um, back home, uh, like you're saying, uh, things have really changed. Uh, storytelling formats and news, you know, shows uh, have changed from the linear way uh, of doing things to the non-linear way. So even newsrooms have to adapt to the fact that um, they shortcut on certain uh, editorial gatekeeping processes. Why? Because they need to beat certain tight uh, deadlines uh, before I can send my story to an editor, before the editor can go through or, 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 or fact check some of these things. Uh, a blogger or website will be posting a mere picture and just a caption uh, uh, of, of, of that picture. And, and, and that goes to, to, to be a viral you know, story or a news item without going into depth of the basics of even just the five W's and the H. So there's a lot of unprofessional conduct in getting the eyeballs. Uh, it's a battle of likes and that puts a lot of pressure uh, on traditional uh, credible media houses uh, and this is where the trend seems to be shifting. So uh, obviously uh, traditional formats have shifted now to online. Uh, there's been disruption, formats have changed, consumption uh, and uh, viewership trends, uh, obviously moving from traditional screen onto gadgets and online platforms. Okay, so obviously um, I love your answer because you've basically set the context around the environment that most mainstream media houses currently have to work under because you're competing literally with that kid in campus who could break uh, the biggest news story of the day simply because they were at the right place and they had an iPhone and they were able to put it out and it went viral. So now for those of us who are in this business, because what we are saying here is that when we are talking about bringing storytelling back to the news, that treatment is very important, that a lot of the times treatment does trump topic. So why is it that how our story is told can sometimes be more important to the audience than the topic itself. Maybe to you, Max. That's an interesting question. Um, me as a news guy, I always like to think that the topic itself is recognizable if it's important or not. And for some topics, that's, that is definitely the case. Take the COVID pandemic, right? Um, everybody knows this is, this is super important. We can see uh, with our numbers that uh, our audience has also recognized that, you know, you don't need any further ex explanation, but um, for other topics that might not be as obvious, and that's what I was talking about earlier, you need that context, right? You need to focus and, and, and make, really make, a, make a, a pitch and say, this is why we're bringing this to you. And, and then obviously with, with your audience, you have to see how it works. Being a global uh, media organization, it is even trickier because people in different parts of the world want different things or think that different things are interesting. And it depends also how this affect their, affects their lives. And now that's why, for example, for our TV operation, we need to di differentiate. We have a, um, just to tell you what, what works and what doesn't work, we used to have a News Africa window 
that was every day for 15 minutes, right? And, uh, but our partner uh, broadcasters in different African countries didn't really like it that much. And I think one of the reasons is because we, we were trying to play uh, catch up a little with uh, what national broadcasters are doing. And we're, we're just not as good as the national broadcasters and many things for that. What we're very good at though, is connecting the dots and putting things that are happening in different African countries uh, into perspective and connecting them to, the, to what's happening on the global stage. And that's something that a, a national broadcaster might not be able to do. And that's why we switched that format now. We're starting to do that next week into a half hour weekly format where we really try to get that in-depth look, try to connect it to what's happening on the global stage together with our correspondents in different African countries and give the context. And we see that this works. You know, We see that it works with our uh, audiences in different African countries. So it's about, you know, what are we good at? We're good at that. What do people want from us? That's what they want from us. And, and it also matches what we're supposed to do. You know, Deutsche Welle, as many other broadcasters, has a purpose and you cannot, a purpose of existing and you can't really ignore that either. So those three things need to be uh, combined. And this is with context, going in depth, trying to make sense of the news stories, not in 30 seconds, but really making people understand what this means for their lives. That's what we're good at and that works. Okay. And maybe a uh, same question and to you, Joseph, do you believe that treatment sometimes can trump topic? Yeah, yeah. of course, uh, the way you treat a story is, is critical. Uh, but before I get into the treatment, I thought I needed to elucidate a little bit more in, in what we're trying to achieve. You see, news has become like a drug. Uh, people actually want to consume news every minute and the stories keep changing. Uh, I think traditional way of storytelling will not change. I think what is important is to have a transformational element in terms of understanding the way, the speed at which the audiences are reacting. Uh, it's true that there are issues like fake news that is elicited because people want to break news fast. They, they, they want to speak to the gallery. Sometimes you have to have a, a perfect mix between the ethical consideration, but also uh, how is your news going to transform uh, your community? I think then the trust that we talked about is how you build the trust. People will say, I'll choose, I'll choose NBS because if there's something happening in, in Uganda, they rely on NBS because NBS has established a track record of, of not just being traditional, having the traditional elements, but also being able to adapt to the new, the new normal. Like, for example, one of the biggest experiences I, 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 we did was to launch uh, a COVID bulletin. A COVID bulletin, but the COVID bulletin was not talking about how many cases uh, that are happening because everyone had the, 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 the access to this information. It was how the topic is going to affect, you know, aviation is going to affect employment, is going to affect people's, you know, psychology. Now, creating that in depth, you know, kind of approach to news and being able to speak the kind of language that people would want to see because people would adhere to stories that speak to them. Uh, people would, would, would attach that kind of sense to, 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 to the way the stories are treated, the way they speak to their, to their livelihoods, the way they speak to their communities. And I think we need to be cognizant of the fact that we are operating uh, with a 77%. 77% is a very complex, you know, audience. This audience, you, you need to have a perfect balance of what they want and what needs to be done. So, yeah. so it's true that we have a very big challenge in our hands. We have to reinvent ourselves to stay in the game, not to become absolute uh, in the way we treat our stories, the way the stories are delivered, you know, and there are, there's a lot that has to change uh, in, in, in the whole you know, treatment and, and, and stuff like that. Okay, maybe just to expound, uh, when he said 77%, obviously that's one of the shows that uh, DW distributes here on the continent, but at the same time, it's almost like paying homage to the fact that Africa has one of the youngest populations across the world. You know, 77% of Africans on the continent are actually youth below the ages of 35 years old. So when we're having this conversation, it's also framing it in the context that for a lot of networks, for a lot of platforms, that is who your audience is. 
And at the same time, there's research that is also coming out and saying they are not interested in news. And I have a very good question here, which I'll pick right now, where someone is saying that um, having social media event, uh, having social media events position TV news as more of a summary and explanation of events, which really goes back to the topic that we, to, to, to the uh, conversation we are having around the treatment of the story. So ideally, when you're talking about trying to debunk that myth, that now because there's social media, mainstream news almost becomes like a summary of everything else that's happening on social media. Yet the reality is, still within uh, the different editorial desks, that there's a lot of consideration when these stories are being put out. So things that ideally contribute to becoming the elements of a good story, like detail, connecting deeper to themes. Can you maybe just touch on that in the wake of, um, you know, just a, school of, a different school of mind that perhaps suggests that, hey, maybe because the audience is the 77% audience, they're not as interested in that style of news anymore. I mean, let's start with you, Max. You're always pitching me the tough questions here. In the book. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we all, you know, even if the younger generation, uh, the millennials are, are different in their media consumption than older people. We're still all, you know, at, at our core, we're all still the same kind of people. That doesn't change from a generation to a generation. Yeah. It's where we all feel the same things. We might feel them for different reasons, but we're also all diff still interested in the same things that our parents were interested in. Getting a good education, making sure that maybe younger generations still have a chance, that we don't uh, use up all our natural resources. That hasn't changed. So as long as you have that DNA in the story you're telling, you're going to reach people. Right? And then it's about, and that's why this, this, um, this panel here has the right title, then it's about how you tell that story. But the different ingredients of the story, I'm, I'm completely convinced, are still the same because the, the problems that people face are still the same. And if you want to reach out to a younger audience, and I think that's especially true for many African countries because of the demographics, you need to give, you need to give answers, right? You need to, they want answers on why does it take me three hours to get the university in in Lagos, for example, why does it? Why is it so hard for me to make a living? Those things. Uh, that's those are legitimate questions that other generations have asked themselves too. But now this gen, these generations usually have access to much more information, and are much smarter about that information. And that's something we have to keep in mind. You know, that's that's. I think that is probably the most important thing. If you don't, if you don't do that, then at one point you're going to be the mom and pop television uh, that you, you know older generations watch. That's not what we want to do. We want to make sure that the younger generations that we answer the questions they're asking. Um, does that make sense? It does. It does. And maybe just to hear from Costa, how have you adapted? Um, well, uh, thank you so much. Like I said earlier on, uh, I think online. You know, uh, digital platforms have have sort of disrupted traditional formats um, uh, and traditional methods of telling news. But but we definitely need to adapt. And uh, what we've understood in our case is that, um, uh, for me, uh, online platforms, be it you know Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and, and all the apps that are available, are just but a means of how uh, all of us in the content space can put our information through. Um, and I still agree with what Max said earlier on that uh, credibility uh, and truth telling uh, remains the hard currency of what journalism and uh, proper media uh, should be. So um, for me, yes and no, that, that, that TV news is more a summary uh, of, of events on social media. I think we still remain relevant and, and, and why? Uh, let me give you a typical example of what we've done. For us in Zambia's Diamond TV, we pride ourselves in being the leaders uh, as far as credible media is concerned in breaking news. So we've got a product we call News on the Go. Um, as a story happens, we, we break it. Uh, if it's a developing story, obviously we'll add details that, that people can still follow it every hour. Now, what you will watch in our main news show, which is at 8 p.m. in the evening, is obviously if you went to our Facebook page or you go to our Twitter you know, account, uh, we will break a story 
uh, as it happens, be it an accident or a big pronouncement that has happened. But we'll, we'll go into the details that you talk about. And, and, and that's the biggest difference that the audiences, including the 77%, will not find uh, on, on the social media platforms. Um, the, co the colleagues have spoken about uh, the global elephant right now, which is COVID. And I'll just tell you something interesting that happened in, in, in Zambia. Uh, a lot of uh, citizens uh, did not believe at the beginning that uh, COVID was real and that uh, COVID uh, existed. Uh, and some of the reasons they gave is, if it does exist, show us uh, that people are really dying out of COVID as we see on Deutsche Welle, as we see on BBC or CNN, because uh, that's the way the story was being told in the consequence aspect of, look, the disease is real, the statistics are high, and these are the consequences. So uh, like, uh, just to go back to your earlier question of, um, can topic be dampened by the manner in which the story is told? Uh, for me, I feel yes, if, if you, you may have a good subject, but if, if the way the story is told, that subject could be watered down in terms of its importance, and COVID is one big example, like Joseph said, if you're just going to be giving statistics and updates every day, um, uh, uh, pasting on social media, anybody can do that. But if you go and look at the human side of this, the person to person, the emotion, the intimacy that that newsroom storytelling brings about, it goes to, to take a story further. It brings about reflection. It brings about the transformation of consequence that Joseph is talking about, because at the end of the day, we want to get something out of that story. How has it impacted in terms of the consumer? Has it provoked some behavioral change? Has it sparked some action and so on? At the end of the day, I feel traditional media and, and, and the credible currency is what we uh, in this business return other than the fast breaking news of clicks and likes uh, that we're currently seeing. Okay, so uh, everyone has sort of like touched on the issue that now more than ever, speed, speed is literally part of the game now. And when it comes to either breaking the news fast, and I think Costa, you mentioned this, that you've also had to perhaps uh, adapt how the newsroom structure is set up. And maybe just to hear from each of you, what are some of the learnings that you've had? Because we know that news in itself is very, there's a hierarchy in most newsrooms. So how has that hierarchy sort of like had to evolve to make sure that it fits the demand in which the audience wants their news delivered? Uh, Max? I think it's a one-two punch. It's always been a one-two punch. If you say it, it's like a boxing match, right? So the first punch is always, you gotta get out there as fast as possible because uh, otherwise you're just gonna be thrown under a bus as a news organization. That's what I meant. You gotta ride that wave when it hits you on social media. And the second punch is explaining, giving context, going in depth. Now for the first wave, what has changed? Uh, funny enough, um, in the last year, I think like probably, I, I don't know about uh, my, my colleagues on the panel, but we installed um, new, you know, using new programs, new apps like Microsoft Teams or Zoom that we're using right now. So everything possible is through chats and video conferences. Now, this has huge advantages when it comes to breaking news, because we also started having breaking news channels on those in those programs, right, on Microsoft Teams, which sort of eliminates the hierarchies a little bit, because you have one breaking news group, for example, and you make sure that all of the, the people that matter or need to know are in there, and then you just say, breaking news, we have this and that happening, we're sending somebody out there, and that's it. You know, you don't have to have endless telephone conversations where you go from up to, to low down there. So uh, COVID has helped us um, in that sense to be even faster than before. And uh, for the second, that gives you always time to, for the second punch uh, to, to really think about how you can put, after that, deliver the context that I was talking about earlier. Okay, and Joseph? Yeah, I think uh, the element of technology right now uh, becomes very critical. Of course, everyone has a smartphone, but I think traditional media still has a lot in terms of investment in technology. Once you have invested in technology, for example, we've established a system where we can be able to get have our bureau chiefs, our stringers across the country. Uh, that's very important because it works on the element of you know speed. Uh, but I do believe that the element of credibility is still in, in the structure of the traditional uh, news methods, it has to stay. There is no way 
there has to be fact check with, with fake news happening and all these things that cannot even be debated because of the news is, is, is so critical to countries development and, and, the, and the reverse is true. So, so whereas everyone can you know, report and do a story, it's important that the, 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 there's a paradigm shift not in the way uh, really should be done. Technology can change, we can embrace technology, which we have as next media. For example, we'll break a story, like for example, Magufuli's death. Uh, we, we have partners in Tanzania who we can be able to link and start to widen this story, try to talk about his legacy, try to, to look at his, you know, his legacy in regards to you know, leadership and all those things. So keep widening the whole scope. So, so for me, technology is critical. Uh, we have to continuously invest in technology, but we also have to invest in our people, which is our cardinal pillar at, at MBS. A journalist must understand that, yes, you cannot go out there and get a story and wait to break it six hours later. You have to have a process that allows you to prepare the full depth of the story, but also the ability to break it within real good time after you've done some very fast checks. Uh, so you, you have to have a perfect balance between breaking it very fast and having credible, credible stories going out to the public because of your brand equity, again, because of your reputation and, and things like that. So I thought that's, that's very, very important for us to really explore. Right. So as you talk about negotiating journalism's boundaries and experimenting with storytelling, I'm sure that, and it was mentioned here, that a lot of the times in most uh, newsrooms, sometimes there can be a tendency to rely on the mold, you know, the inverted uh, pyramid structure. So when it comes to now innovating, and really being committed to make sure that when it comes to informing the user that you are delivering news in the most interesting and innovating ways. Of course, ultimately the main objective being to enhance the storytelling. So, so what are those tools and innovative ways that you've perhaps you know, implemented in your own newsrooms mm -hmm. or you've seen being done elsewhere? And this is where we are talking about things like VR, we are talking things like graphics, like, what have you seen out there and what can everyone else in the industry learn and adapt just to promote and enhance storytelling? Uh, let's start with Costa. Uh, thanks, Tamima. Just quickly, uh, I just want to add on, on uh, the previous question and what my colleagues have commented on because it's, it's a very interesting uh, aspect of, of what all of us in, in, in newsrooms uh, experience. Um, just one interesting, uh, I, I want to just cement the fact that uh, the issue of uh, no matter how long it takes to verify the, the, the truth in a story, I always advise my journalists, even if it takes you six hours, eight hours, you're better off a newsroom that delivers a story those few hours later than uh, the other competitors, rather than be sorry to come and uh, retract uh, or withdraw you know, something that you had wrongly you know, put. We need to understand the importance of, of, of news telling. For me, um, my example is so strong that a journalist who does not deliver truth and verified or accurate information is like a doctor who prescribes the wrong you know, medication. Um, we, 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 we had an incident here where somebody reported of a minister you know, dying, uh, just posting it on social media, like, like, like it was gossip um, and, and people were, were busy tagging this page. And uh, you know you have so much pressure in the newsroom to say, look, we're being scooped, let's break the story. Um, and, and people had to come and defend themselves with the use of, of certain words to say, no, we, 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 we said the minister has allegedly died and so on and so forth. So for me, uh, those things are very critical. No matter how much we need you know, uh, likes, uh, it, it doesn't hurt to get it right the first time in journalism. I think we are in the business of getting it right the very first time. Uh, coming into your, your, your question on what innovations are we putting in place? Like I've said, formats are now you know, changing. I think people are not going for lengthy uh, news hour shows or, or, uh, you know, because everybody's on their gadgets now, people are busy. So what we've done in, in, in Diamond TV, for example, is that we've got uh, a team that definitely looks at just social media. So we've got a dedicated team 
that is looking at what is going out on Facebook, on Twitter, uh, in shortened formats uh, as the day goes by, uh, using uh, live you know, phone technology, um, like um, you know, Joseph has said, throughout the entire country, connecting everybody, um, whether through Zoom technology or whatever it is that they can send into the hub. And then we decide what is the shorter version or format that goes onto Facebook, what goes onto Twitter. The longer you know, videos can be put uh, onto YouTube. Um, so when we come to the main uh, content on TV, uh, for us, it's not more a summary. It's more the developments in terms of the analysis, the investigation, the expert you know, voice or analysis that we, we, we put into that. So it brings about a lot of interesting elements in terms of uh, how you optimize the use of technology. You've spoken about you know, graphics. So now reporters uh, can go in the field single-handedly without a cameraman, uh, without a sound man, uh, but basically go with a phone and play around with the information for different platforms. So an exciting time on the business end as well. It's, it's, it's cost um, uh, uh, effective for us, like, like Max has said, doing, using Zoom, using you know, Skype and so on. Some of these technologies are definitely benefiting us uh, from the traditional ways of sending a reporter physically onto the ground. Okay, super. So obviously a lot of what you're saying resonates because um, I had a, a channel of, that the audience is a bit more younger skewed. So I talk directly to the 77%, they are my core audience. So we've really had to be very innovative around how it is we present the news. For instance, our formats are shorter than everyone else in the market. Our stories are very quick and to the point. Uh, we have to be very visual because then you understand the kind of images, the kind of um, support material that lends itself to the voice of the story actually matters a lot. And even small things like even who is telling the story because sometimes you could have a very good story, but the wrong messenger, the point really just doesn't get across. So we found that uh, obviously talking to the 77%, we've had a, a lot more room to be a bit more experimental, uh, even conversational wise. Sometimes you'll find that the tone that we'll use in certain news programming is very conversational. And uh, across other platforms, that would never fly. But what we found ultimately that what the main thing that leads our editors is how is the best way to get this message across to them? And even interestingly in Kenya, there's uh, one local radio station. So youth here speak slang and the version of slang they speak in Kenya is called Sheng. So there's actually a radio station that broadcasts news in Sheng because they are very clear about the fact that our audience is youth. We might sit here and speak the Queen's English, but realistically, if we deliver the news to them in Sheng, it helps them connect better to what is being said. So, and it's, it's amazing because then there was a point where by the entire industry was buzzing about it. And I know even some colleagues of mine in TV were trying to experiment with how can we then now adapt this and put this in TV, which of course opens a whole other kind of worms because then we have to go back to who are you targeting? Perhaps in radio, it's easier. But it's just interesting that these are the times that we are living in. And probably uh, because you have uh, all touched a bit on the impact of COVID-19 on your businesses and how you operate. So what would you say are some of the biggest learnings when it comes to negotiating the boundaries of journalism? Maybe let's start with you, Joseph. Thank you very much, uh, Tamaima. I think uh, COVID-19 uh, you know, I don't think will will happen in our in, in the next hundred years because it. We hope got, not. <laughs> hope it doesn't because it really really shook the status quo. It kind of you know made us think even better in the way we approach. Uh, you know, the, the deployment, for example, how do you deploy journalists on a daily basis? How do you start to rethink? Uh, the process, how does technology more than ever become more important? How do you, because news gathering is a very expensive venture. That's, that's the other thing that people sometimes say, but why don't they cover this? Why don't they cover that? It's a, it's a very costly thing uh, for you to, to completely have a comprehensive story. I can tell you it's, it's very expensive. So how do you get the journalists? How do you get the entire team across the ecosystem to understand how do you reduce the cost of of getting the story, but still don't lose the gist of the matter. So COVID-19 has given us that, uh, but also it makes us realize more than ever before uh, that citizen journalism uh, or new media can, can create a gap 
that that needs to be filled. So so for me, COVID nineteen has been a, a a kind of not a blessing in disguise, but an eye opener, if if I'm to be precise, on how we can maximize on on telling stories. We actually realized we did a lot of live stories where a journalist doesn't have to go to the field, but you have a lot of this Zoom approach, you have a lot of this Skype approach. We've done a lot of work with Dutch Vela where we cross almost twice a week on issues that you know connect. Uh, to our audiences, uh, and, and that has been, you know, very, very nice, and it's always short because that link is about a minute or two, but very fast, cognizant of the fact that people uh, are very fast, the young people are very fast, they, they, they want snappy news, but also the way we've delivered our news as NBS is changing, uh, is, 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 is very transformational because gone are the days when we are very particular about certain things. How do you start your news intro? How do you, we've had a situation where on a Friday, uh, we'll have uh, the intro done on a bike somewhere. Uh, and, and let me tell you, that, that style, the way the cameras, are, the cameramen are working on, on the shots, you know, is, is so critical. So it, it's, it's really moving in a direction where we, we can still tell the story in an ethical manner and make it more exciting in the way it's delivered. So, so I think that's, that's one of the things people need to take away in this discussion for us to keep our audiences engaged. Yes. Okay, so as we wind up, uh, maybe to you, Max, then uh, Costa. Yeah, thanks uh, very much, Tamima. And thank you, Joseph, for pointing out that uh, the work we do together. And I just wanna say here that uh, the cooperation with our partners in different African countries is absolutely crucial so thank you guys, big shout out. And uh, we hope you'll like our new format starting next week. Um, you said a couple of very important things there and uh, uh, we don't have that much time, but I think the, what we haven't talked about yet, technology obviously has been changing for a long time and COVID is accelerating that. I would say one of the downsides of that is you don't have direct access to politicians and sources anymore. That's really tough, but you know, you can, you might get them on your screen but with a click of, of your mouse pad. So that's an advantage, advantage, disadvantage there. And I think extremely important, and that's what social media has taught us also for the TV operation is we do need to change our perspective. The, the, the way where you sit as an anchor on TV and you present the news from high above to everybody sitting below, like you were sitting on a throne, those days are over. Everybody needs to change their perspective and try to go down to that's for example a 77 percent that tv magazine what we do does so well right but that's a perspective we also need on tv just not just on our social media platforms being down there making people understand we we know where they're coming from we are with them on the ground that's why these these live crossovers make sense because you're talking to people that are on the ground that builds trust because you you know they know what they're talking about and that then the empathy that we, when we're as journalists, when we're on the ground, we understand what people are thinking and not just sitting in a TV studio presenting the news. That change of perspective is definitely something that social media has taught us, more traditional journalists as well. It's something we're also using for TV, not just on our social media platforms, on top of, and that's also important, the data that we're getting from social media. Social media, we see what works, right? Even if the audience might be a little different, but we do see what reaches people, what works, and that's important data we also use for the TV operation. So, uh, Costa, very quickly, we have one more minute left. Yeah, thank you so much. I think uh, uh, after all has been said and done, uh, it's times that call for innovative storytelling to adapt and fit into the current platforms that have been brought about by social media. But I do agree that uh, the human element uh, of the emotion, the empathy and so on needs to be put in there. If you tell a story just using technology um, from the studio, uh, the believability, uh, the emotion will not be you know, channeled out into that. So COVID obviously teaches us an aspect of how to use technology, but um, allow me also to salute across the world. I think everybody has spoken about frontline health workers, journalists in the newsroom have been very, very fantastic because they've been at the front line taking cameras, taking microphones into the thick of things to show the world. Because if it were not for the media, 
who would have known about the figures, who would have known about what is happening. So um, it is because of that human to human element that we've been able to tell and things are beginning to look up as far as the COVID situation is concerned. So it's a hybrid of how we adapt and how we still keep the basics. For sure. Well, thank you so much. This was a great conversation, great meeting of minds. And again, I want to thank uh, DW for putting this together, the taxis and all our wonderful panelists for making the time. And of course, anyone who's just participating, I really do hope that we earn the privilege of your time. So thank you so much. And I'm sure Shana can clarify how if anyone wants to perhaps share uh, this conversation to other people that they can via the taxis platforms.